Hello? Hey, this is Mr. Burger. I was wondering if you could leave a note uh, telling folks to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, yes. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist, a master educator, and I'm here to provide you, believe it or not, with the best in art historical content, well, that, that I can provide. If you like what I'm providing, like, share, subscribe, do all those things to interact. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. It's very unpersonal, impersonal. Now, there are many art groups of art historical relevance out there, and one such group is the Ashcan School that came out of New York. Today, as you know, because we, because you clicked on the video, uh, we're going to talk about the Ashcan School that came out of New York and provide you with a little bit of background on that. So let's jump right in. One of the first movements to originate in the United States was the Ashcan School coming out of New York. Now, prior to this, in the early 1900s, shows had to be approved, and a group of artists known as the Eight had an independent show away from the salon, and they got a huge buzz. Robert Henry, Arthur B. Davies, Ernest Lawson, Maurice Pendergast, George Lukes, William Glackens, John Sloan, and Everett Shin were the artists that were known as the Eight. The Eight came out of Philadelphia, and although a lot of their work was made in New York, Philadelphia was really the roots of this movement. They wanted to create a redefinition of what realism was, as they were looking at Gustave Courbet and the realists from Paris, but putting their unique American spin on the idea. The Eight would only exhibit together one time, with their show opening on February the 3rd in 1908. They wanted to bring art closer to the real grit and the daily life that they experienced in New York and Philadelphia at this time in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They were rebelling against those academic traditions, the American Impressionist ideas and academic realism that was being seen created by artists like John Singer Sargent, William Chase, Kenyon Knox, and Child Hassam. The squalor of profanity regurgitating over and over again. The artists that were working at this time in New York were creating an evolution in bringing the artistic ideas back to a more recognizable reality by painting the poor neighborhoods, the kids playing out in the streets and with their friends in the city, prostitutes, pool halls, subways, alcoholics, crowded buildings, aggressive boxing matches and wrestlers doing battle, poverty, and a depiction of the truth behind what was thought of as urban life. When you're looking at these artists, like for example the artists labeled as the Eight were primarily working their day jobs as newspaper illustrators. They were trying to have a more journalistic approach and quality to the type of art that they were making. So it wasn't just painting a picture, it was really telling a journalistic story about what was going on at that time. And they do not take kindly when you let them know what you do for a living there. Really being led at this time by Robert Henry, four of the eight, known as the Philadelphia Four, namely Lukes, Glackens, Sloan, and Shin, with the addition of Henry, became the backbone of a group that was known as the Apostles of Ugliness, but eventually would become known as, as we know because you clicked on the video, the Ashcan School. This was kind of a tongue-in-cheek sort of a reference to schools of art and things like that that were very in fashion at that time and to some extent to this day. 
but the name sort of came about in a unique way. You see, there was a critic and cartoonist named Art Young, and he was looking at a lot of these artworks, and he wrote that the pictures of ash cans and girls hiking up their skirts is a bit of a harsh criticism of the work that these artists were producing, and the apostles of ugliness felt that this was a very amusing and flattering sort of anecdote, and eventually they would adopt the ash can school from from that statement and the name would stick. Very similar to how the Impressionists got their name, you can check out my video on them, but redirecting our attention to the Ashcan school, these artists were focused on subject matter above any sort of technique that they would use. The group was not really organized as a truly organized movement or governed by any set of rules. And to some degree, this was also really about storytelling through art. They saw this truth in realists like Courbet and Edouard Manet that were creating their realities in Paris, and they wanted to create this sort of identification in America. But as Americans, we do things our own way. The Ashcan School would create their works a little bit darker. They would use a more subdued palette of colors and incorporate rough textures. Although not exclusively true for every artist because they didn't work by any set of rules like that. The artists worked with complete artistic independence and freedom individually. The movement would grow and grow and, starting with five, it would explode into a whole movement of artists that would include George Bellows, Jerome Myers, Guilford Beale, Lewis Hine, Eugene Higgins, and Glenn Coleman. But as I've said a couple of times, this started with a core group of five artists. Let's look at each of those five. Yes. Robert Henry was really the spiritual leader of the group and organizer that wanted the others in the group to really understand the earthiness of the group and create works with an authentic grit of the New York City experience. He wanted them to truly capture what they were witnessing. He would encourage them to not be fearful of offending the contemporary standards to make art that was truly genuine. As mentioned, Henry organized the Eight, the Philadelphia Four, and the Ashcan School itself. He was a painter, he was an educator, and studied in Paris and brought the ideas of Impressionism back with him. Beyond his trainings abroad, he would also study at the Philadelphia Academy of the Fine Arts and other places along the way. He was a very devout educator. He had taught at several schools, including the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, and was able to teach such notable students as Joseph Stella, Edward Hopper, and his wife, Josephine, and perhaps hundreds or thousands of others. His students were encouraged to come to his own house where they would have weekly discussions about art, ethics, literature, music, and politics. And he would encourage them to paint what you feel, paint what you see, paint what is real in you. I love to paint. Oh, really? Yeah, I love to paint. Oh, wow. Are you any good? I don't know. Of course not. William Glackens was a realist who was very much trained by Henry. He was an artist and reporter for the Philadelphia Record as well as the Philadelphia Press and eventually would share a studio with Henry in 1919 as he was being encouraged to make art a full-time job and not just a hobby. Please, God, give me the answer! George Lukes was also an educator and artist who created portraits and genre paintings of everyday sorts of people. He would study in Europe and was very much influenced by the artworks of Rembrandt and Franz Halls. His day job was working for the Philadelphia Press and eventually moving to New York in 1896 and eventually joining Henry's circle of social realism where he would create artwork that really reflected the poverty of the people living on the Lower East Side of New York. Oh no, what am I gonna do? 
Everett Shin would create and focus his attention on low socioeconomic urban sorts of themes. He was an illustrator and cartoonist for the newspaper and loved to put some attention on artworks that centered on the theater and some even compare him in design and approach to Edgar Degas. Oh, I can see Linda doesn't like that. <laughs> John Sloan was an illustrator, painter, and printmaker that focused also on social realism, which is really the more broad umbrella that the Ashcan school really falls under. He had a bit of a reputation as the bad boy of the group, and there are several very interesting stories maybe we'll get into at another point. Like many of the others, he worked for the newspaper, including the Philadelphia Inquirer, and was artistically trained at the Philadelphia Academy of Art and Design. He would eventually rent some space from Henry, and they worked very closely together. Artistically, he would create works that focused on urban scenes of New York City, and was very much seen as the premier artist of the group. He thought that the Ashcan school had gotten too big. There were too many artists that were doing too many different things for it to really be a group that had an association for everybody. So although he was a member, he wasn't always really happy with being a member. I despise it with every fiber of my being. In 1913, modernism would really take over and it wouldn't take too long for the Ashcan school to pretty much fizzle out. Modernism was really becoming a new philosophy, a new trend in art production that was really going strong between World War I and World War II. And it was in that chunk of time between those two world wars that this wave of new artists was very much emerging and the Ashcan School was seen as something that was outdated. The American modern artists were taking over. These were artists that included Morgan Russell, Georgia O'Keeffe, Charles DeMuth, Gerald Murphy, and Stuart Davis. Who did that call my name? Yeah, I called you up your name is. <laughs> Within the Ashcan School, there's a lot of names that are not too terribly known in the mainstream today. The Ashcan School doesn't have a lot of glitz and glamour around it, and there are not a lot of people that are creating in the style of the Ashcan School. But without the Ashcan School, there would be so many artists that we would not know today. So many artists were influenced by the work that they were doing. So many people were affected by the storytelling that they were creating the truth of poverty and what was happening in the city and their way of life that was being recorded was no doubt influenced by the artwork and the artwork was influenced by the life that was going on. The real existence of these people was being recorded by the Ashcan School. Something that we can all think about and implement as we're making art or observing art in our contemporary world around us. I hope you got something great out of that video. Make sure you like, share, and interact. Appreciate you uh, for your uh, for your efforts. We'll see you next time. What is this world coming to? Beat me, Jefferson. All I got to say is, here's to yesterday. <laughs>